welcome to a new course in a new uh, semester um, in a new setup also we think uh, because of course it's a very old setup <laughs> to us now it's new um, I'm, I didn't teach on campus uh, since March so I'm really happy to be here uh, back to be in class uh, interacting with, uh, with all the students I think this is a completely different experience than the online, online setup so I hope inshallah that we will continue with that setup um, until the end of the semester and inshallah will be for all courses starting next semester I hope inshallah um, so welcome to, uh, to big data class make sure that you are in the in the right class you know that the, this course is course listing uh, 653 and that's for the master students and 670 uh, sorry 753 uh, which is for PhD students okay so if you are not registered in the right uh, section or the right uh, number please switch to the other number okay okay I usually uh, start with this Oh Allah let us learn what would benefit us benefit us from what we learn uh, and increase us in knowledge and I hope that this uh, this is always our goal sorry Amen. Amen. yes um, and I also add this من سلك طريقا يلتمس فيه علما سكن الله له به طريقا من الجنة whoever follow the path to seek knowledge herein Allah will make it easy for him and he will rise and I hope that this is our intention uh, okay so we are all here because of big data so I think the first question that should come to your mind is why why are we here why why we are talking about big data? Why big data is a, is a big deal? Why should we care about uh, big data? So the, the answer is very simple, uh, at least to me. Um, and I think you will realize it if you didn't already. Data is everywhere around us. So I will give you here some numbers just to make sense of how large the data that we are dealing with uh, is. Um, so here I'm, uh, I'm, I'm quoting, of course, from this uh, source that um, we have about 33 zettabytes in 2018, which is projected to be 175 zettabytes in 2025. Of course, the first question is, what is zettabyte, <laughs> right? Um, so any, any answer, do you know what is it relative to what we used to know? Do you have any sense of what is that? Huh? Thousand of the, uh, of course it's it's something like that, right? Uh, we know we, huh? Type type. Now we know of course we know megabyte, right? Which is around what? Once one thousand byte, right? Megabyte is one thousand byte, right? One thousand. Oh, sorry, one million. One million byte. Okay, which is one thousand kilobyte. Okay, so one million byte is one mega, right? We know that. We also know the gigabyte, right? Which is one thousand megabyte. And then terabyte, which is one thousand gigabyte. Okay, what is beyond? We are, we are used to that, right? Uh, now the, the size of the, the disks that, that, that are in the market is within that range, right? In, in terabytes, okay? But maybe what we as, as uh, end users, maybe not very familiar with what is beyond that? Okay, so let me show you uh, data size is 101. Uh, so we, we got into that, right? So terabyte is um, a combination of four thousands, right? Because we said one mega is one million, then one giga, then one tera. Beyond that, we have petabyte, which is one thousand terabyte, then exabyte, which is one thousand petabyte. Okay, so we have here. Um, uh, what 18 zeros, right? 18 zeros. Then 1,000 exabyte is zettabyte, which is what we are talking about here. Just to to have a sense of how large this thing is. Okay, and then zettabyte. So this is 21 zeros. 21 zeros, which is 1 million petabyte, which is 1,000 terabyte. So that's and it's. It's 1,000 times 1 million what we really know, which is the terabyte. OK? 
Okay, it's a huge number. This is a huge number. So back to the slide, we are saying that we have 33 zettabytes in the, what we call the digital sphere. Okay, that's all the data that, that of course, that's an estimation of the data that we are dealing uh, with, or that were dealt with in 2018. Okay, and just to be more accurate, this is the data that are created and captured and replicated. Okay, uh, probably might not be saved. Okay, so some of them might not be saved, just processed and, 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 uh, and that's it. But that's the, the total data um, that was in 2018. To give you an, uh, another uh, idea of how large uh, is that, uh, when we projected to 2025, uh, according to that source, it will be 175 zettabytes, which is about four times what we have now. Uh, actually, uh, five times, more than five times what we have now. It will take one of us 1.8 billion years to download. Just to, to, uh, to, to see how large it is. And if it's, uh, if it's distributed over all people in the, uh, in, on Earth now, it will take about 81 days. If, if all people shared the download together for all the time, it will take 81 days to just download this data. Okay, so this is huge. This is huge data. Um, some more numbers. Um, what happens online every minute? Every minute. Okay, so we have around 500,000 half million tweets every minute. 4.7 million videos views, 400 new users on, on Facebook, 60,000 images uploaded on Instagram, 200 million emails were sent every minute. Okay. Imagine uh, um, uh, these numbers and imagine starting uh, um, in, this, in this course, imagine how we can process these, these uh, sizes of data. More numbers, this is for days, for a day. Okay. Uh, so on one day, we have about 500 million tweets, um, 4 terabyte in connected air, uh, cars that are the uh, cars that are connected to the, uh, to the internet, uh, to, the, to the network. Um, what else do you see here? 50. 3.9 billion emails or 3.9 billion people with emails. Okay, so these are I mean, just, just numbers. You can, of course, uh, look at the, uh, the exact uh, numbers here. But the gist of all of that is that we are really sailing in a sea of data. Whether we, uh, we, uh, we see it or not, it's around us and we all contribute to it. Okay, in one, uh, one way or, or another. These are some old numbers from the previous course in 2018. That's three years ago when I, I taught the course. Three years ago I had this slide. And, and you, can, you can start to, uh, to compare. But uh, just to give you also another idea. Um, Google in 2012, like nine years ago, they were crawling 20 billion pages a day. 20 billion page. Billion page is 1,000 million, right? So 20 billion page per day. Okay, that, that's not the whole web, of course, at the time. That's maybe part of the web. <coughs> that's nine years ago. Now it's much more, of course. Uh, the search index is 100 plus petabyte. Um, um, Twitter didn't change a lot. It's still from 2015, it's still around the same number. Actually, I, I heard that it is even less than that um, in the recent years. But still, it's a big number to have half million uh, tweets uh, per day uh, is a lot. Um, Hadoop, which is something that we will, of course, uh, hear about in this course, uh, a Hadoop cluster in, in Yahoo in 2014 had 350,000 nodes. Uh, processing 365 petabytes. Okay, that's a cluster of 300,000, 330,000 
codes or processors dealing with the data that, that at uh, Yahoo at the time. Okay. Um, now the question is, did we have this situation before? I and mean, this is this is new to us, or to the world that we have. Do you have a question? Okay. Um, is that new? I mean, we didn't have this before, and suddenly now we have lots of data that we have to deal with, or this is actually old. The answer is yes or and no at the same time. It was. They, there was data that is large at the time, but we were not maybe much be much involvement. Okay, we we didn't uh, care about that. Small maybe a few people care uh, about that, but end users didn't. Okay, or maybe didn't uh, uh, see it clearly as we see it now. Supercomputers were there since I mean, tens of years. Okay, actually in 1997. Uh, we started to see supercomputers, as we will see, inshallah, in the next slide, we'll see a, a nice comparison. But uh, at the time, we needed supercomputers to do what we call weather forecasting. Yeah, and weather, weather forecasting, of course, is a problem that, that is uh, really old, it's not new. But we need uh, supercomputers to do the mathematical operations fast enough so that we can do these predictions. But end users, of course, didn't need to, uh, to do that, right? Um, so the data was there, the, the, the need for processing lots of data uh, was there, but we didn't see it as we see uh, today. This is a ni very nice uh, uh, comparison between a supercomputer that is called Play 1A that was uh, uh, introduced in 1978. That is one of the most, that, what is called one of the most successful supercomputers in the history. Um, in 1978, and comparing it with a uh, supercomputer by IBM uh, that was introduced in 2012. You can see here the, um, uh, and you can only look at, you don't need to look at exact numbers, but you can look at the ratios, okay, the comparison between these two, uh, two computers. You can see that in, in terms of number of cores, the number of cores went uh, uh, so much more than what we had before. It's about 50,000 times what we had at uh, 1978. Uh, these numbers are even uh, more uh, interesting. Um, for example, the memory, if you compare the memory that we had in that supercomputer, this is not a, a home computer, personal computer, that's a supercomputer at the time, uh, and the memory that this, uh, this, uh, this machine had, it's 13, like 14 million times the, uh, the, uh, the memory that uh, this supercomputer had. So also the, uh, um, uh, the computing power had advanced a lot since then. Okay. And that's of course any, uh, on our advantage that now we have the power that is possible to, uh, to process all of this data. Um, this is Cray 1A. It, it looks really funny. And I don't think you could, if you came across it, you would think that this is a computer actually. With, with our uh, norms now, it looks like, uh, it like, it looks like a fan or something. Okay, but it's actually, yes. Um, when you compare the numbers, you can see the Yeah. Uh, between the, the, the problems? Of course, the number. We didn't have such. Uh, such the problems uh, that were happening were maybe more efficient than what the founding builder of Power Summit So, what do you mean by more efficient here? Of course. Well, it's 70 terabytes compared to the data that, 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 that you put in the number four or seven, maybe it's not that fast. That's yeah, that's, that's, that's why we, yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Uh, oh, yeah, 
Yes, I think the data is increasing in maybe much more fast, much faster than the computing power. Yes, but still the computer, يعني, يعني, luckily the computer power is still uh, 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 increasing, but the data I think, uh, in the, especially in the recent years, are increasing much more. Uh, and and uh, um, we will talk about that, I think, uh, during the, the lecture, that we are part of that. Um, okay, any other questions? Okay, so this is K1A. And this is IBM uh, Power 7. That's nine, I think, nine years ago. Now, you can think of this supercomputer that was here. Now it is in, in our cell phones. And maybe, uh, of course, our cell phones may be more, more powerful uh, in terms of computing power than, than the supercomputer. So that's just to, to show you uh, that now the, the machine that we have uh, on hand is really powerful relative to um, the supercomputers that, uh, that, that were uh, in, in, uh, in what, how many years? In uh, 50 years. Okay, so what is the problem? Now, um, what is the, how, how we can compare the situation there and the situation now? Before, it was just maybe the governments caring about this supercomputer thing and the, 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 the powerful computing uh, to, to deal with, with data of that size. But now, many entities, many stakeholders are uh, um, uh, caring okay, about such data. Uh, many businesses, even individuals, researchers, societies, many entities, many stakeholders. Okay? So we are involved as researchers as, and as, as end users with such data. Okay, so that's the that's a big difference between the situation now and the situation uh, um, in the uh, in the 70s in the past. Okay, in the past we didn't care about that. We didn't have a problem uh, dealing with such data because this data even was not accessible to the to the end users. Right now we have access um, to the companies, the researchers. They have access to lots of data that were not available. Before. So the focus is on how to make computations of big data feasible without a supercomputer. Now, why we are saying without a supercomputer? We have supercomputers, right? We can deal with that data easily with supercomputers. Why should we care about that now? Cost on what? On whom? Exactly, exactly. So the stakeholders now of such data cannot afford, of course, supercomputers. Okay, cannot afford supercomputers. So we have to find solutions other than powerful machines, okay, to deal with such data. And that's all what this course is about, is how we can deal with these sizes, these sizes of data without having a supercomputer. Okay, so that's the main uh, main uh, idea here. That's the main focus now. Okay, and we will, inshallah, uh, explain what we mean by cluster commodity. Right? But just uh, uh, briefly, we can replace the need for a supercomputer by what we call a cluster of commodity hardware. So cluster means a group. Okay, so cluster of normal machines, like desktop machines that we can have at our homes. If we have a cluster, if we have a group, or a collection of these machines, we can really crunch, we can process large amounts of data. And that's how, or what we will inshallah learn in that course. So this is the roadmap for today. We are done with why big data, why we should care about big data. And, and simply the answer is because it's everywhere around us. We, next we will uh, talk about what makes data big data. When can we say that this is big data? And not every data is, is big, of course. So what makes data big data? Where does it come from? What are the sources of, of big data? Why we are that excited? I hope that you are now, at least me. Uh, why I'm so excited about big data? Okay, why the researchers are so excited about big data? 
What can we do with, with big data? And finally, what is big data analytics? Because we, we will uh, spend uh, maybe 80 or 90 percent of the, of the lecture talking about big data, but we will not talk about analytics until the end of the lecture. Next lecture, inshallah, next week, we will start to talk about how we can tackle this, uh, this uh, amount of data. How can we process it? Okay, so today is just an introduction to the field. So the first thing is what makes data big data, but before that, let me introduce myself. Okay, so uh, my name is Tamer Said, if you didn't uh, know me yet, if you didn't take any courses with me before. Uh, my uh, office is at the engineering annex building. And this is my phone number. My research interests are two. The major uh, uh, research interest is information retrieval, which is the topic of the course that is uh, um, being taught in parallel to this, uh, but on Tuesdays, if you, uh, if you are interested. And my minor speciality is this field, which is uh, big data analysis. And at some point, I will tell you, um, at some point today, I will tell you how I came to, uh, to have both. What is, what, what is the, uh, uh, so I will tell you some of the story of how I came to this, uh, but uh, during the course you will see why or how they are, these two specialities are related at some point. A bit of my history, I'm Egyptian, I uh, got my uh, bachelor degree in the University of Alexandria in 1997 in computer science, and then I went, uh, I got also my master from uh, University of Alexandria in 2001, then I went to the US to get my PhD from the University of Maryland in College Park in 2009. Uh, I spent one year as a postdoc uh, in, uh, in the same lab. Uh, in, if you didn't know, uh, postdoc is just a training period before you apply uh, for faculty positions. Uh, you do uh, much broader research than your research on, uh, on your PhD. During my PhD, I spent uh, a summer uh, at Google uh, as a software engineering uh, intern. And uh, after I finished my PhD, I went for another postdoc at Kaust, King Ab Abdullah University of Science and Technology in Saudi Arabia uh, in 2010. Then in 2011, I decided to go back to my home country, Egypt. Uh, uh, I got a position as a researcher in Microsoft in Egypt. But then I changed my mind and I applied for academia again and I got the position in Qatar University in 2012 as an assistant professor. Uh, then uh, I, uh, I was promoted to associate professor next year. Um, a bit of my teaching style, just to know me if you didn't take courses with me before. Uh, I have lots of interaction in class. I will ask you questions and please ask me questions also. And uh, whenever you have any questions, just raise your hand and uh, don't be shy of answering my questions, please. We all learn from from our mistakes, if, if even uh, if the answers are wrong, that's fine. Um, I like to know and memorize your names, and I think I know the names of most of you. A few I didn't maybe uh, memorize yet, but I will show very soon. Uh, I like to give practical assignments and projects, and you will see that uh, in, uh, in the course, inshallah. And I like to learn. Every time I teach that course or any other course that I teach, I learn something new. Uh, whether from the, the new material that is now uh, in the field or even with interacting with students answering some of your tough questions. Um, and now let me tell you how I came to big data. Um, because there, there are some lessons that, that I need to, that, uh, I need to uh, exchange with you. Okay? So I can say that big data changed my life. Might be a big uh, claim, but uh, but you will see how. So once upon a time in 2007, I had an internship at. Uh, I was a PhD student and I got an internship at Google. Okay, I got a, a chance. I have been interviewed and and I, I got uh, an offer and I went there to spend the summer. And it was a summer that I cannot forget. Uh, in, in many uh, aspects, but the aspect that, uh, that is related to the course, you will uh, hear about it in this slide. I came to know a new programming model called MapReduce that was just uh, uh, published to the world, I think, one or two years before, uh, before 
my internship. But I didn't know about it at all, and I was not uh, uh, any. Uh, I was not familiar at all with that model, even in my university. Although my university is one of the uh, good universities in the US, of course, but I had never heard about it. So when my mentor told me about uh, MapReduce, uh, I was not even uh, able to pronounce it the, the, the right way because it's, it's like I, I don't know what MapReduce Map Map. Uh, I have no idea how to even pronounce it and what is the meaning of that. But uh, when I when I started to use it, I found that it is really really a powerful model, and I like it so much. But I was back after three months to University of Maryland <laughs> after I used it in Google and of course as you will see it has to have uh, you have to have a cluster of machines to use it okay and that was not available at Maryland so I was really sad when I came back my advisor said hey, why are you sad and, um, you learned a lot in, in Google I said yes but now I don't have I cannot use what I learned because there are, there are no resources uh, at university uh, that I can use. Um, but it happened that at the same time when I came back, uh, an open source uh, implementation of MapReduce was introduced by Yahoo. Okay, so MapReduce, as, as you will learn, uh, was uh, introduced by Google, but the code, the, the system itself was at Google. It was not uh, open source. It was not public. Okay, but they published the paper. When they published the paper, um, one researcher at, at Yahoo re-implemented the system and made it uh, public. And that was a breakthrough uh, uh, um, to the field, okay? Because now so many people started to know about it, okay? It is called Hadoop, and I think next time you will know why it was called Hadoop. I mean, next lecture. Um, and uh, I came to know that once Hadoop was available, IBM and Google had uh, a collaboration initiative they said that uh, Google will produce, will uh, provide uh, a cluster, I think, if I remember, it was like 20 machines at the time, um, uh, to 10 universities in the US for the PhD students or for the graduate students to use it to start to learn what MapReduce and what Hadoop is. Uh, of course, that was a big advantage to me. Maryland was luckily uh, one of these 10, uh, 10 universities. Um, so I, I thought that when I heard about that, uh, I thought that, that that's great. Now I can use MapReduce in any way. I want to use MapReduce in my PhD. I have no idea how. Uh, my PhD was completely different from uh, what someone can think of using MapReduce, but I wanted to use it. Okay, so I, I, uh, I uh, uh, signed, uh, signed up, of course, for the service. I started to use the, uh, the, uh, the machines, and then my advisor uh, asked me how you can use that for you. PhD. I came up with idea. Uh, now I have a problem in my PhD. MapReduce is all about scalability, so let's scale up uh, uh, my, uh, my problem to do more than what I was even planning to do. Um, so it had really a big change in my PhD. And yeah, when I went to, uh, to uh, um, uh, Google, it, I was maybe halfway in my PhD. In the second half, of course, MapReduce was not in the plan, but it was all over the place in the second half after I came back from Google. So it, it, it made a big change in my PhD. But that doesn't make a big change in life, of course, right? It's PhD is just one thing in your life. But what made really a, a good um, uh, impression about my work is that the, the very first paper that I did using MapReduce is still the most cited, cited paper in my history. In, in research, uh, although it was not exactly seen how it is related to my PhD. It was really a short paper, but it was, it was really nice, uh, nice paper, um, and it, it, it made it to be ranked one in my profile with, with, uh, with that number of citations, which is not that big, but to me, it is really uh, a great achievement. Um, then it, it really changed my way of thinking. After uh, I finished my PhD, I said, okay, now I know something that very few people know. Not only in, in our region, but maybe in the world at the time, of course. So I should continue in that line. I should find ways to uh, uh, 
bridge the two specialities together, IR and big data. Of course, it was not uh, called big data at the time. It was not coined uh, at the time, but IR and MapReduce. I want to, uh, to really bring this, uh, bridge this gap. Um, so this is how it changed in my life. Uh, one point is that it changed the rest of my PhD between 2007 and 2009. Uh, I think, probably, um, I was the first uh, in the world to use MapReduce in, in, in my PhD, just because I had the opportunity to, uh, to have an access to the, uh, to the uh, IBM Google uh, initiative. Um, within the period 2008 and 2011, I had more than 10 publications on MapReduce or using MapReduce. Um, till this moment, the top three papers are from that period in, in, my, his, in my profile, uh, just to, to show you the effect on, uh, on my research. Um, last time I, I told the, the, the class it was the top five, but today it's, it's, it is the top three. Um, I, when, I, uh, when I was a postdoc in, in, uh, in Kaust, I proposed an idea around MapReduce to a master student and he got his uh, thesis uh, in 2011. Uh, I taught a, a new course in, uh, I co-taught a, a new course at Kaust, which is, was called not big data analytics, but it was called large scale computing. Uh, in 2011, it was the first time to be taught. When I came here in, in QU, I uh, pushed hard to have a course like that in QU. Uh, from 2012 to 2015, I, I was trying. It was uh, finally accepted and it was um, uh, taught in the first time in 2015, second in 18, and this is the third version. Uh, I got a big uh, uh, research grant on uh, something that is related to uh, uh, MapReduce or Big Data Analytics uh, within 2016 and 2019. I got very nice, uh, very strong uh, papers in, uh, in very top uh, prestigious conferences like DLDB and CIR on uh, uh, MapReduce related uh, topics. Um, I also finally last year had a student who did uh, her master thesis uh, on, on something that is related to big data analytics. So this has really changed my research agenda completely. Just for, from knowing about that model in, in just three months. So it really changed uh, my life since, since 2007. And, uh, and that's why I called my group here Big IR, just to remind myself that this is, this is a, a big uh, trademark in, in my uh, research life. The takeaway messages from here, um, exploit big opportunities. Whenever you have an opportunity to learn something, new, when you, after you learn it, you will, try, you will see ideas that, that you can use for. So exploit the opportunities whenever uh, it comes uh, to you. Uh, be keen to learn new technologies, don't be afraid. Um, of course, this will get you out of your uh, comfort zone, right? Because you are used to uh, traditional programming, right? All of us are used to traditional programming, right? which is programming on, on one machine. This is a big switch. You will now program to run your code on cluster of machines in parallel, okay? You need a different mentality. You will find it really hard in the beginning. So that's completely out of your comfort zone, of course. But whenever, when you reach to that level, this will open for you a really uh, large, set of opportunities that you didn't think of. And apply it quickly. And this is very important. And I think that the, one of the reasons behind my, the, my top paper to be that I decided, because I, I used the technology very soon after I learned it, before anyone else uh, thought about, about that idea. And do something you like. And I, Especially in, in my PhD, I, my PhD was completely different from that. It's a problem that should be done on single machine completely. Okay, but I liked the idea of MapReduce. I thought that this is really will will change our, our thinking in, in computer science, and, and it was really a breakthrough in, in the field. Um, so I wanted to, to use it. I did something with it. 
because I like it. Even though that the plan was not like that. <clears throat> it was not written in my proposal to use MapReduce because there was no MapReduce at the time that I submitted my proposal. Okay. Um, now we switch to what makes data big data. Any questions before we, as we continue? Okay. Type. What makes what makes data big data? What do you think? When can we say that data, this data is big data? And don't tell me because it's big. When it, whenever it's big, it's big data. When what 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 sense of big? When we have no resources. When we have no resources. No resources. Okay. So if I, uh, I have small computer, hmm. but but now you are saying big data, right? But that's what we wanted to uh, to define. Um, so whenever we have low resources relative to the data, then we can call this data big data. That's what you're saying, right? Right. Okay. Can you explain that again? But but sometimes also small data can be complex. If it's completely unstructured, the relations between the parts of this data might be complex. But still, it's small data. Okay. Of course, when the data increases, the complexity will increase. <laughs> yes, but but I want to 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 uh, uh, disentangle the the, uh, the two these two things: complexity and size. Uh, yeah, sometimes, with very small data, it might be complex, and maybe a, a very large data is not complex at all. Okay, so uh, they are not they, they are not usually related. Okay, uh, so we cannot say that big data is big because of complexity. It's of course because of the size, right? But the question here is, when can we say that this is big data now? It's very close to what what you said. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. So that's one that's one definition. Okay, so that's one definition. So data that is big is too big for one machine, one normal machine. Okay, so if the data is cannot fit, cannot be processed in one machine, then we can say it is big data. So it's too big for the CPU memory for any single machine, larger than the disk storage of a single machine. Okay, and not, we're not talking about supercomputer here. Okay, it's commodity. Commodity means and it's something like the desktops that we, we had to have. Yes. Exactly. 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 Okay? Exactly. Okay? So we we come to that in, in that slide. So big data, this is the definition by Wikipedia. Big data is data sets that are so large or complex or complex that traditional data processing application software are inadequate to deal with them. Okay, so that's a bit different from the previous definition. So the previous definition is, is, was about the machines. Here, we are talking about the software, the current software. Okay, so if the traditional data processing software is not uh, good enough to deal with, uh, with that data, so uh, we can call it big data. But now back to, to your point, this is a dynamic definition, right? And whether this is the, uh, the, the, the previous, uh, in the previous the definition, the previous slide, or in that slide, this is dynamic because that changed over time, right? So big data, data that is called big now, will or will not be big data in the future. Okay? Probably it will not, right? And, and that's very clear with, with the sizes of the, uh, of the disk spaces even that we have in our machines, right? I remember that, I think, I think the first, I'm talking about memory now, 
uh, the first uh, computer that I used, I think it had a memory like uh, maybe 64K bytes, K, I think, if I remember correctly. Okay. Hmm? They? I, I remember it was Pentium, uh, even before Pentium. Yeah. Um, now we have, normally we have, what, gigabyte size. Uh, that's normal. That's very normal. But we started with K, and maybe one mega or something like that. Um, so at that, at that time, big data is not, it's very, it's, it's negligible with, with the scale that we have now. So the definition, of course, is dynamic. Usually, we, uh, uh, people define uh, big data with uh, three Vs, okay? Uh, and at some, sometimes it is extended to five. So the first three is volume, uh, which means uh, we have large amounts of data. Variety, we have different uh, types of data. Okay, so that's what characterizes big data. The volume, the variety, and the velocity, that the content is changing very fast, which means that data is increasing. Okay. So these are the three standard uh, Vs that, uh, uh, that characterize uh, big data usually. Uh, some people add two Vs just for fun, uh, but of course they are related. The first one is value. So we need to get some value. What can we get? How can we get a value out of this data? Or what value we can get from the data? And the veracity, whether we can trust this data or not. Okay. But uh, these are not very uh, traditional. The traditional definition is with these uh, three things. Now let's talk about the types uh, of the data. We have mainly three types in, in, in data. I think we are all familiar with structured data, okay, which can be seen as tables. Okay, whenever you have rows and, and columns, this is uh, an example of structured data. So this is well-defined, very well-defined fields. The other extreme is unstructured data, like HTML is unstructured. You said HTML? They are not structured completely. Uh, but actually, they are the third type, okay? But I'm talking about the, the other extreme, which is completely unstructured. Like what? Uh, articles, okay? Text in general, okay? Uh, videos, uh, images, right? All of these are uh, um, unstructured. Uh, of course, humans can understand this easily, right? But, of course, uh, this is very hard to be understood by machines. And in between, there are uh, semi-structured data like HTML, like XML. Uh, that is, uh, there are some fields that are structured, but within uh, some fields, there are unstructured data like text. Okay, so it's a mix between uh, structured and unstructured. Uh, velocity types. What are the types of velocity? We have what we call batch processing. Okay, and this is a very important concept that we will. Uh, uh, talk about many times in the course. Batch processing. What do you mean by batch processing? When you have data that you already collected, okay, offline, and you want to process it. Okay, so you run multiple proce processes or multiple steps to process this data completely offline, in the background. Okay, so you collected the data already, so the data is there, and you process it. That is what we call batch processing. Okay, is that clear? Oh, uh, no, not usually. Uh, you can do batch processing for any purpose, for business uh, uh, prediction or whatever. Okay. So that's one. The second one is near real time. In near real time uh, uh, type, we have some delay between the time when the data is available and the time when the data is Processed. So in batch processing, this time is very large. It can be days, it can be weeks, okay, it can be years. But in near real time, there's small delay between the time when the data is available and the time when the data is processed. And there is real time. 
which is uh, which requires immediate processing of data once it is available. Okay, so it, it cannot afford delays in uh, in data. And we'll talk about examples which are about uh, today and uh, the, other, the next lectures. Yes. From where we'll talk about that. Okay, but these are this this is a general concept. These are general concepts. Okay, of course there are examples for for each. Um, and and this is mainly depends on the application. Okay, some some application requires immediate action. Some applications can afford some delays. Okay, and some applications can be more relaxed and and you can do the the analysis or the processing that you, you uh, that you do in uh, in a background process. Okay. Um, I think we saw uh, we saw this uh, before. Uh, but this is an example of, now in, in the context of the three Vs, uh, this example of volume and uh, velocity, okay, uh, which is the Twitter example. Um, we had more than 500 million tweets a day. We can collect them, okay, over days, and maybe every week we do some analysis, okay? If we do that, what is, th what is that called? What type of... If, if, we, if we collect the tweets every day, okay, and per week we do the analysis. That's batch processing, right? Okay, it's every week. Okay, time. Um, of course, the volume also of the data is, is very huge, right? If, 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 you, uh, if you think about it. Now, there are some peaks, so there are some events, when this data is even uh, uh, um, uh, larger in sizes, and when when there is an event that is happening, of course, more tweets are posted. Okay, so that's kind of velocity. Uh, the data is the rate of the increase of the data might change over time, and you have to deal with that. Um, how about search? I mean, if there is an event and you want to search about tweets about that event, okay, what type of processing? Out of the three types that we uh, we talked about earlier, should that be? Why is it real time? Because it's uh, because it's tweets are posted uh, uh, all the time. Okay, but now we are talking about the processing. For that application, do we need to process the data in batches, offline, or we can afford some delay? or we have to process immediately. These are the three types that we talked about, right? The batch processing, the uh, near real-time, and real-time. Which one of these, you said real-time, right? Uh, who, those who uh, attended courses with me before know what is the next question, right? Why? Why? Because, because in, in, social me in, in, in social media, and if you are if you are following an event, you need you you, yeah. you will be disappointed if you get something from a year ago, right? If when you search, you get tweets from uh, last week, even last hour, right? Yeah, last week is very clear, right? Last hour, maybe you need to think about it. Yes, if if I'm following an uh, updates on elections or or a uh, football match, or, uh, one hour is, is too late. And خلاص, it's obsolete. Okay, so in this case, you need real-time processing. You need real-time processing. So that's an example of, uh, of real-time. But of course, as we said, we can collect the tweets and do some analysis that is not, uh, uh, that, that doesn't need instant, uh, instantaneous processing, uh, which would be in that case, uh, batch processing. Another example of velocity is movie recommendations, okay? Um, are you familiar with the recommendations in general? I think you are, right? Even if it's not movie. Uh, like when, when you go to Amazon, right? When you buy a book, it will tell you, your friend, uh, other, those who bought this also bought this, right? Uh, so that's a kind of recommendation. Also, when you have in Facebook uh, uh, friend recommendations, that's, uh, that's, that's very similar to movie recommendations. 
Type. Why we are talking about velocity here? We said velocity means that data is uh, changing over time, right? Type. Why? Wh where is the change here? The change here is that every time, uh, every now and then, one person likes something, okay? And when that person likes something, that can trigger a new recommendation based on that, okay? And in that example, both likes that movie. And when that happens, also Alice liked that movie. That was not recommendation anymore, any, uh, yet, okay? And then Jane disliked that movie. Based on these three things that happened, now the system that is processing these, uh, uh, these uh, uh, clicks or likes will process them and is thinking about whether it should suggest that movie to Frank or not. Based on what is going, what is happening now, or what what has change it in the, in the recommendations, yes. Uh, there is no uh, v for variability here, but variability no, is, is changing, right? Velocity, yes. No, what I'm saying, uh, uh, I used to read that in my master we did six v's even, so it's not. Six what? what? Six v's. Six V's. Yeah. Okay. Three what was it? Three basic ones: volume, uh, velocity, and variety, and three acquired ones: variability, value, and veracity. So what I'm saying, this reminded me on that uh, this linkage and, and, and change of data. I mean, in some literature we call it uh, variability. variability. Okay. I, it's, it is also related to velocity because it's changing yes. over time. Okay, is that clear? Okay, another uh, nice example also is uh, restaurant locator. So the task here is that um, given a person location anywhere in the world, you want to build a system that will list for that person the top five restaurants in his immediate neighborhood. I think this is there now, right? Uh, without uh, saying the names, and you, you are familiar with that, okay? Where is variety and velocity here? Right, let's, let's talk about variety. What is variety first? Yes. Various types of data, okay? Various types of data. Now, what are the, the different types of, uh, of data that we need to have such application? You need? The location, okay? So you need maybe a map. So that's a, that's a type of data. What else? The user location, okay. Which is just a uh, couple. Ratings for the restaurant. Ratings for the restaurant. Ratings for the restaurant. Yes. Images. How images will be? Uh, are we in the look? The the okay. I mean, the end by Kalam the Monza. Okay. <laughs> and if I like the the restaurant with the, with moonlighting, <laughs> should, yes, of course, it can be. Okay. What else? What else, uh, what else uh, similar to uh, ratings? Reviews, which is text, okay? So you need all of that. And maybe also you need something about the history of the, of the person. Where did he travel before, or the, the, the location that he, he, he was before, things like that, right? Um, preferences, yes. So you see now the variety of the data that we need to deal with in such application, right? Where is velocity? Huh? The ratings and reviews change. Uh, they appear more and more ratings and reviews come over time, yes. Yes, the restaurants are changing. They are changing their menus 
they are changing their prices, right? New restaurants are open New over branches. time. New branches. New branches. Huh? The timing change, yes. Uh, maybe in the summer they will uh, change the, the timing, or maybe the week, the week that they decided, for for some events, uh, some holidays, they will open more. Things like that. Uh, your location, of course, change. Yes, yes. No, but but the, by definition here of the problem is that you are given one location and given one location, so that's a specific problem. Um, but yes, of course, it, it will it, the location of the person will change. Okay, so you see now you see the the the, the variety of the sources of the data or the types of the data in that problem and uh, the the fact that also the data is changing. You have a question? Can? Uh, that's not the question, right? <laughs> we can pray, of course. <laughs> yes. Uh, let me just finish this. I think we covered. Yeah, so we covered this. Okay, I think this is a good time to, uh, to stop. Uh, so we will pick up from here, inshallah. So stop and come back by 6.15. Okay? Thank you.